Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Poetry International Festival and welcome to this program called The Craft Talk with one of our festival poets, Togara Mutsananamo. The Craft Talk as a Poetry International Festival event has actually been introduced uh, for the first time today here. And for, this, uh, for these talks, we've asked a few of our festival poets to zoom in on a particular aspect of their poetry and their poetics and to talk a little bit more in depth about what they want to achieve with their poetry and how they do this. Um, and I guess the idea behind this is that poetry, among many other things, is also a craft that could be mastered and all of our festival poets have their own ways of doing so. So tonight, or um, in this program, uh, Togara Mutsananamo is going to um, tell you all about the craft of his poetry. And Togara Mutsananamo was born in the Zem Zambian city of Lusaka and spent his childhood in Zimbabwe. He studied in both Paris and The Hague um, and then turned, returned to Zimbabwe where he now still lives. His Dutch translator, Jabik Veenbaas, describes Mutsananamo as an empathetic poet, a poet who doesn't just show the reader the contours of his own personality, but also gets into the minds of other people. Mutsananamo's poetry is characterized by a driving lyrical tone and a subtle plasticity. So as a poet, uh, Mutsananamo, I've, I've read, um, is inspired by a range of other poets, uh, from Les Murray to Seamus Heaney, and he's um, most fascinated by the visual aspect of poetry. And it is exactly this, um, the visual aspect of his own poetry, that he's going to discuss with you today. Um, he has transitioned from writing prose poetry to writing in fixed forms. And so he's going to talk all about the importance of line endings, uh, rewriting and reshaping words, and about free verse and fixed verse. So please welcome to Gary Mutsananamo. Good evening. Um, I'm going to give a talk about uh, writing in fixed forms and the uh, difficulties presented to me when doing so. So I'll start with an introduction as to how I came to write in fixed forms. Then I'll talk about a particular poem and um, how it was written and the various problems I encountered with it. When I left high school in Harare some uh, 23 years ago, I came to the Netherlands to study business administration at a very small university situated in The Hague. I just turned 17 and had no idea of what I wanted to do in life. Up until that point, I wasn't really passionate about anything, only vaguely interested in physics and chemistry because these subjects seemed to speak in codes and formulas that balanced and worked to maintain harmony, a world that existed in rules and laws that came to my glancing mind without any nuances or fractures or even rebellious deviations. Learning about and seeing the equations and formulas intrigued me, but not to a point that would ardently stir my heart. When I arrived in The Hague, alone and young, a new world was suddenly presented to me, a world far removed from the rolling farm fields of Mashonaland West, where our family farm ran busy all year round with crops and cattle. The Hague was far removed from Harare's squat concrete buildings, and the, cold, and the winter cold of the Netherlands very different to Zimbabwe's warm climate and blue skies. Looking back at my arrival in the Netherlands, something liberating, some liberating aspect unlocked a part of my brain that I may never have used had I not ventured into a foreign setting surrounded by new cultures and languages. It was in The Hague that I met an amateur photographer. We struck a deep friendship that was filled with all sorts of discourse on music, paintings, cinema, literature, dance. And it was from these discussions that my interest in literature, particularly poetry, began. And subsequently, it was also in The Hague that I picked up my pen and began to write poetry. <clears throat> 
In retrospect, the first poems I wrote were rigid lines based on lyrical formats of pop songs, lyrics I'd seen inside album sleeves. And as I think of it, when I was trying to mimic the lyric templates of these pop songs, I in turn was being introduced to a, into a style of writing, a loose format of classical writing. Although my primary concern wasn't the rhyme schemes that came with these templates, I was unconsciously introduced to the modern day patterns of old verse forms like the ballad and rondeau. And in my first poems, these shapes can clearly be seen as pedestrian as they are. As a novice, I wrote and wrote with these shapes in mind, but soon abandoned this style when I began to read contemporary poetry. And strangely enough, the first book of poetry I picked up and took home was a book of sonnets by the American poet E. Cummings. I found the poems deceptively simple, the words stripped back to the core, almost skeletal in their lower case. Until then, I had never really looked at a poem. I had never really considered the function of its shape, nor what the role of the shape was in relation to the words and meaning. And even then, on the edge of the realization, I still didn't know what a sonnet was or the rules of the form. I simply enjoyed the poems for what they were, poems. It was not until I, I had left uh, Europe and returned to Zimbabwe that I started to really interrogate the shape of the poem. I began to question why a line ends here or there, why the stanza breaks in a particular way. At this point, I was reading a lot of modern American poetry, Louise Gluck, Stanley Kunitz, W.S. Mervyn, Rita Dove, Charles Simich, Allen Ginsberg, Mayor Angelo, and so on. And in my own writing, I was purely writing free verse. As to why I was breaking a line in a certain way, well, that just came as I pleased. So when I first published one of my poems, the editor of the journal asked why I'd broken a line in the poem in a particular way. I had no answer. And the fact that I had no answer made me feel that there should be an answer. And from that day, I became troubled by that particular question, and it made me revisit thoughts on the shape of the poem, why the poem is shaped in a particular way. And the more I thought about the shape of a poem, the more problematic the issue of the line breaks became, so much so that the line breaks within my own poetry began to hesitate, almost as though questioning my own hand, questioning their function and role. And with each question, the lines began to roll out and lengthen defiantly into prose. The more I wrote, the more problematic the issue became. And the more problematic it became, the wider the door opened to an, to an anarchistic disarray, a form of mutiny that wanted to destroy the way I was writing in order for a new way of writing to come about. And this mutiny eventually took place shortly before I left Zimbabwe to travel to England. Every line of free verse that I was writing refused the casual enjambment and stubbornly marched into the ranked formats of prose. The problem of form had been temporarily solved. The prose poem needed no form. It ruled its shape. I mean, it ruled itself. It had its own shape. When I moved to England, I was uh, comfortably writing in prose. And as I wrote, I realized that there were certain patterns being formed in the prose poems. Certain sentences had X amount of syllables, as certain paragraphs seemed to have a matching or close to matching amount of words. In a prose poem I wrote at this time, which was eventually published in my first book, Spirit Brides, the symmetry between the prose stanzas or paragraphs is clearly visible in the word count. I'll read the poem. The poem is about an accident I had seen on the roadside. In the first paragraph, there are 50 words. In the second paragraph, there are 51. Petals. From a distance, a bundle of branches, leaves, and wild flowers, a makeshift hazard sign when cars break down. A man stood directing traffic on the shoulder of the road. As the drivers approached, 
they decreased their speed. Some, for a moment, stopped. On the roadside, the chaos of a gathering crowd. As I drew in, the swaddled colours of green, pink and brown became the uniform and skin of a child. Her head covered, a stream of blood flowing to the scattered pages of a school book she carried. The wind lifted and tossed the pages on the road, some white, some red. <clears throat> As I realised more of these patterns in my prose poems, it reinvigorated my need to interrogate the function of the line and stanza, and so I returned to the problematic matter of form with great enthusiasm. I began deconstructing other poets' poems and setting them into prose to see how this affected the music of the work. The aim was to deconstruct the poem to find the magic behind the lines, the magic behind the stanzas, the intangible mysteries behind the printed word. It was when I came to deconstructing poems from Seamus Heaney's spirit level that I began to notice and see things that I had not seen before. Two poems in particular aroused my interest, The Flight Path and Two Lorries. The Flight Path, which is too long to read now or show on the screen, interested me because of the various dynamics it possessed. The way the poem was shaped and how the shapes shifted through forms but two lorries immediately caught my attention because as I took it apart to put it into prose, I noticed a pattern, a series of words that were being repeated in a sequence. At the end of each line of the six line stanzas, the words ashes, lorry, coal man, mother, Machrafelt, and load were repeated through the poem and then carefully embedded or end stopped with a concluding three-line envoy. I'll read the poem out to you now. Two lorries. It's raining on black coal and warm, wet ashes. There are tire marks in the yard. Agnew's old lorry has all its cr cribs down and Agnew, the coal man with his Belfast accent, is sweet-talking my mother. Would she ever go to a film in Macherfeld? But it's raining, and he still has half the load to deliver farther on. This time, the load our coal came from was silk black, so the ashes will be the silkiest white. The Macherfeld via Tombridge bus goes by, the half-stripped lorry with its emptied, folded coal bags moves my mother. The tasty ways of a leather aproned coal man, and films no less, the conceit of a coal man. She goes back in and gets out the black lead and emery paper. This 1940s mother, all business round her stove, half wiping ashes with a backhand from her cheek as the bolted lorry gets revved and turned and heads for Macrafelt and the last delivery. Oh, Macrafelt, oh, oh, dream of red plush and a city, coal man, as time fast forwards and a different lorry groans into shot up Broad Street with a payload that will blow the bus station to dust and ashes. After that happened, I had a vision of my mother, a revenant on the bench where I would meet her in that cold, flawed waiting room in Macrafelt. Her shopping bags full up with shoveled ashes. Death walked out past her like a dust-faced coal man refolding body bags, plying his load, empty upon empty, in a flurry of moats and engine revs. But which lorry was it now? Young Act News or that other heavier, deadlier one set to explode in a time beyond her time in Macherfeld. So tally bags and sweet talk darkness, call man. Listen to the rain spit in new ashes as you heft a load of dust that was Macherfeld. Then reappear from your lorry 
as my mother's dreamboat Coleman filmed in silk white ashes. By spending time with uh, this poem and reading more about it, I eventually found out that the poem was a sestina, a, fix, a fixed verse form from the 12th century. Immediately, a lot of questions about line endings were answered by this poem and subsequently by other fixed forms. I felt the need to find out more about these templates, wanting to write within their grids without any anxiety of how to end a line or any other cosmetic worries concerning the look of a poem. As I was getting ready to send my manuscript for my first collection to my publisher, the vast majority of the poems were prose poems. Initially, I wanted the whole book to contain prose poetry, but then this new discovery of fixed forms had begun to take up quite a lot of my time. So enclosed within the pages of Spirit Brides, one can find the first poems I had written in some form of fixed structure. The first of these poems being a sestina about a young couple going through their evening rituals in a small supermarket on the banks of the Seine in Paris. The key words here are supermarket, teller, lips, change, you, and five. Six francs, 75. Each night we bought red wine from a small supermarket, not too far from the Seine, where an overweight deaf teller smiled whenever we walked in. At the counter, he read our lips as we bought the cheapest wine we could find. Never any change, as each time we paid, we paid the exact amount in coins you counted, one by one, into his open palm. Six francs, 75. Late in the evening, you'd count up another 6.75, and we'd walk through the narrow streets back to the supermarket, fumbling through rich Parisians on their way to dinner. And you, who loved the city for our anonymity, became fond of the young teller who seemed alone and estranged and liked us too for the change we brought to his long nights when he read our hearts and lips. Remember when we figured out what he asked behind his mute lips? Why come twice? Why not save yourselves the walk and buy four or five bottles in the early evening? We laughed as nothing would change the way we bought or the walks we took hand in hand to the supermarket. The following evening, as we paid, we looked into the eyes of the deaf teller and said, it's our habit and left it at that. And he smiled more so at you. From that night on, every night, this game with him and you, he'd lift his finger and wait for the silent words to form on our lips, and we'd say, it's our habit, and he'd laugh, the deaf teller, as we played our game, and all we needed was 6.75 on those evenings near the banks of the Seine, in that small supermarket, always paying the exact amount, never receiving any change. Then you left and went away. And so heartfelt was the change each night I cried. And it's safe to say that he too sorely missed you. In the evenings, I still walked the narrow streets to the supermarket, remembering our walks in expensive coats, the jokes in your pale lips, the way you kept the coins in a velvet pouch, the 675 that you'd always count into the soft open palm of the deaf teller. The night before I went away, I looked into the eyes of the deaf teller and told him I was leaving the next day. His round face changed. Something sad swelled in his young eyes as I placed the 675 into his palm. He then signed to the sky, asking if I was on my way to you. But no words this time. I could say nothing. No words of you from my lips. I packed the bottles of wine and slowly began to exit the supermarket. The deaf teller ran to me, tapped me on the shoulder as I thought of you. With no change to his eyes, he shook my hand and silently said with his lips, it's your habit, and exactly 675. 
I smiled and left the supermarket. Unlike my first collection, Spirit Brides, which was vast in its geographies, with poems set in Iceland, France, Brazil, Egypt, Zimbabwe, the Netherlands, the Scottish Hebrides, and other various locations, I wanted to write a book that was centered around one place or set within one landscape. It had always been my intention to write about where I live in Zimbabwe, to write about the farm and rural life around the country. And so I thought, what better way to write about the land and the people on the land than through rhymed lyric poetry? In preparation, it took a number of years to go through the various forms and experiment with the rhyme schemes. I was particularly drawn to old French forms and rhyme patterns. I'm not too sure why, but these somehow appealed to me. Even with various sonnet rhyme schemes, my preference remains with the French pattern of A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, C, D, E, E, D. I have a feeling this has something to do with the research books that were available to me at the time. Most seem to be biased towards French literature. Once I decided upon what, what my next book was going to be about, where it was to be set, and how it was to be written, the problem then came about with utilizing all these forms and rhyme patterns. And this became a huge, huge challenge because although the grids were there, the language I was using wouldn't fit into most of the templates. The key idea would be allowed in, but the language around the idea became a technical obstacle. So here we come to an example of one of the poems published in my second book, Gumiguru. The poem Flight is a rondo, a fixed form from the medieval and Renaissance French poetry. The form dates back to the 13th century and consists of 15 lines that have two rhymes throughout. The first half of the first line being repeated twice in the poem as a refrain. The first stanza rhyming as A, A, B, B, A. The second stanza A, A, B, then the refrain. The final stanza mirrors the first stanza but concludes with a refrain, A, A, B, B, A, then the refrain. As with most poems I write, the poems begin as an idea and the true battle of writing I've discovered is to remain faithful to the initial idea. The idea, unlike the text, is the soul of the poem and the words are purely there to serve the soul. With flight, the core idea was to write about persecution, especially at a time when Zimbabwe was at its most volatile, both politically and economically. And immediately, as I thought about writing the poem, I thought about a young man trying to escape from something, trying to escape from some terrible event. But then, having to write in a template made the whole process of writing very different to how I had written before, where I'd sit at my desk, begin with the first words, and let the words take over from there. Writing flight, knowing how important the first four or five syllables were going to be, made the beginning process all the more difficult, because once those first five syllables were found, they automatically appeared at the end of the second stanza, and more importantly, finished the poem. To further complicate the matter, there was the rhyme scheme that had to be satisfied. But these were not the biggest concern. The biggest problem was language, and how the modern day language of a poet living and writing in Zimbabwe could fit into this fixed form that had been designed some 700 years ago for completely different uses than how I intended to use it. Having, to, having tried to write other rondos before, I was constantly defeated by the refrains. Using the refrain in their traditional sense always made the poem sound dated and the constant repetition seemed too rich for my ear. So I had to think of a way of violating the refrain 
tearing it up or disjointing it in some way that it doesn't appear the same within the poem, cutting it or running it on so that each time the refrain is heard, it's heard differently. So when I was thinking about phrase, I had to think of a phrase that I could manipulate without great difficulty. I'm not really sure how the first line came about, but when the first line presented itself, it meant that I had written just over a tenth of the poem. A tenth of the poem once the refrains rolled into place. And once the first line was written, the final word of the line somewhat dictated what one of the coupling rhymes was going to be. And fairly quickly, from the first line, a second line can freely appear without any real constraints apart from satisfying the rhyme scheme. Once the second line was in place, the third and fourth lines could be written with a, degree of free with a certain degree of freedom, provided they too conform to the rhyming pattern. It was then a matter of writing out the second stanza. And here's where the difficulties begin, because here one has to deal with the first refrain. And for me, this is where fixed forms are challenging. One constantly has to place alternative lines into fixed spaces, and these lines can be affected by other lines placed elsewhere. To negotiate the problem of the two refrains, one has to constantly write and rewrite the lines, sometimes even considering or even indeed changing the refrain to suit the words and hence the initial idea of the poem. And sometimes the revisions of lines or the constant alteration of the refrain may present another equally challenging problem. One may find the poem straying from its original truth or initial idea. And this problem can be both dangerous and enlightening, depending on how you look at it. It can be dangerous in the sense that the essence of the poem may be diluted if one strays too far from the initial idea simply to satisfy the structural demands of the poem. The poem simply becomes a technical instrument, a form on the page without a soul, something flat and unsubstantiated. But then, on the other hand, in some rare cases, something new may be born out of the constant rewriting and re revisions. A new idea may present itself and form the basis of another poem. But in the case of flight, I pretty much stuck to the initial idea and wrote and rewrote and revised the poem based on the nature of what the poem aimed to address, a detail of some form of persecution and the struggle to be free from that persecution. And so the figure in the initial idea is presented as a young man trying to flee his captors, a young man almost broken by a violent ordeal he has had to endure his body twisted and contorted by pain as he tries to get away to some sort of safety. And so when writing the poem, when I built up this image, I wanted some sort of jaggedness to the line and rhyme. And so within the poem, there is use of short sentences. The first sentence comes in sharp to represent the refrain, and the double rhyme throughout the poem ends on hard syllables that reinforce hardness, brutality, and violence. Words like threat, beat, concrete, heat. I'll conclude by reading the final version of the poem. Flight. He kept running. Miles of emptiness, heat, and jagged stones wouldn't stop him. His feet bled. His swollen tongue filled his mouth. Forget them. How could he? How could he forget their screams, the canned echoes of concrete walls? As the blind hand of the sun beat down on him, he knew they were dead. The heat quickened his heart with thirst and fear, yet he kept running. For days, he'd had nothing proper to eat. He thought of Tendai, how they nearly beat her to death when they found him. He should have let her know. He thought of their last night when the threat of death vanished as they fucked in the heat. He kept running. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Tagara, for that wonderful insight uh, in your craft. And thank you all for your attention. Um, although this is the last day of the Poetry International Festival, there's still a lot of poetry to enjoy tonight. Um, we're closing the festival later on this evening uh, with a true poetry fair and with uh, readings by all the festival poets. Um, before that, you can come here and listen to readings uh, by several of our festival poets, while in the main auditorium, they're focusing on translations during the Translators Slam. So enjoy your evening, and thank you very much. <laughs>